On behalf of the National Eczema Association, I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar Wednesday presentation, You're Newly Di Diagnosed with Eczema, Now What? I'm your host, Danny Morshead, and today's webinar is being made possible in part by an educational grant from Sanofi Regeneron. And our presenter today is Dr. Peter Leo. Dr. Leo is a board certified dermatologist and a fellow of the American Academy of Dermatology. He is assistant professor of clinical dermatology and pediatric dermatology at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine and the founding director of the Chicago Integrative Eczema Center. Dr. Leo is a member of NIA's board of directors and a member emeritus of NIA's scientific and medical advisory council. And with that, I'm pleased to introduce our presenter, Dr. Peter Leo. Thanks, Danny. Uh, I'm very glad to be here. And tonight we're going to talk about sort of the very first steps, what you might do once you first get that diagnosis. And it's interesting because this is not something that I meet a lot of patients with anymore at this phase because my practice has gotten sort of specialized. Almost everybody I see has seen at least one other doctor, sometimes two or three other doctors. So it's kind of interesting to think back to the very beginning and what, what would I tell somebody who just found out that they have atopic dermatitis or eczema? These are my disclosures because there's so many things happening right now in the world of eczema. Uh, I get to be part of lots of advisory boards for different companies. I've done some research for different companies, including the National Eczema Association. Uh, and you can see here that, uh, that I also do some speaking as well. The thing I think we all understand is that atopic dermatitis really causes a huge amount of suffering. And I think of it as, as sort of synonymous with being miserable. And of course, it's not just the person who gets the diagnosis. It's often the whole family that suffers along with them. The, the Not only the way it looks, but the way it feels, the itch, the pain, the lifestyle effects that it has that are really far reaching, the effect on sleep. And of course, especially when little kids get it, if they're not sleeping, a lot of times nobody's sleeping in the whole house. So it really takes a terrible toll on patients and families. We know that there are so many people who are affected on the order of 10 million children in the United States and maybe as many as 16 million adults in the US. And we know that historically we've thought of this as a childhood onset disease. That is still true but there are patients who actually develop it as adults in increasing numbers. In fact, 20 years ago when I was in training, we talked about that as maybe being something different. Adult onset eczema maybe was different, but now we really think of it as just part of the same family. And what's confusing is that the numbers have continued to go up. So back in 1997, it was only around 8% of children were affected with atopic dermatitis. And back in 2017, it was up to 12%. So that number seems to keep going up. And we think there are a lot of reasons why, but that's clearly telling us it's not just genetics, right? Those numbers are happening way too fast. Those changes are coming faster than genetics would allow for. Uh, we know that many patients are under burden from all sides, including economic burden. The economic burden is probably $5 billion a year or more, and that's conservative. But the good news, there is some good news. We are learning more about it than ever before, and there are new treatments out there. And so that's really exciting too. And this is evidenced by this awesome chart. This is looking at a graph of the number of publications in PubMed, which is one of the big uh, government uh, kind of repositories for papers and educational journals. And we can see in 1945 to 2022, this is an exponential growth in knowledge, which is incredible. So there's lots and lots of new ideas and new publications and lots of people talking about it, which is wonderful. So what do we know about it? What the heck is going on with this? Well, we know that it is a very old disease. It's been around for a very long time, maybe even in ancient Egypt. One of the ancient Egyptian papyri called the Ebers papyrus talks about a disease that sounds like it could be eczema. It's hard to know, but it could be that old. It comes from the Greek words for the result of boiling over, this idea that something is boiling out of our body, coming out through our skin. And we usually use the term eczema and atopic dermatitis synonymously. They're not truly synonyms. Eczema is a broader category. Atopic dermatitis is sort of one flavor or one form of eczema. But we know that this is something that affects a lot of people and it presents in a similar way. It's usually red, it's itchy, it can sometimes be flaky and scaly, but sometimes it can be wet and oozy. And it often is a chronic condition. That doesn't mean you have it forever, but you usually have it for a long time. We know that some people get better over time or even kind of grow out of it, which is really nice. 
We also know that it is pretty heterogeneous, meaning it doesn't all look the same. There's lots and lots of different presentations, sometimes even in the same patient. I'll have patients who have the dishydrotic form, little blistery guys between their fingers and on their toes, and then maybe open oozing areas on the face, and then maybe thick lichenified, that kind of leathery thickened skin over other areas. You can have it all at once or different patients over different times. We know that that also are age-related patterns. So babies tend to present in one way. They often have the cheeks involved and sometimes more on their elbows and knees. Little kids get the folds. That's usually where we see kind of the classical form. And then adults often get on the hands and feet and sometimes on the face and neck. Obviously, all the different variations can happen. And these are just more kind of general patterns that we see. It's just sort of interesting. We know that there are a number of conditions that we kind of put under this larger group. And we've been talking about, this is a paper we put out a couple of years ago saying that we think that this is almost a spectrum of conditions that fits in here. And this includes things like chronic hand eczema, numular, the coin shape eczema, follicular eczema, where you get the little hair follicles are kind of bumpy and almost looks like goosebumps. Uh, all of these different things, even a form of paragonodularis, kind of the itchy bumps, sometimes people kind of pick at and rub at, that can also be a manifestation of eczema. So that makes it again, very difficult not only to diagnose if you're not deeply into this field, but it also makes it really tricky to treat because you see these different patterns. I think the most important thing that we've learned is that there are some really key features that bring everything together. What I like to think of as these pathogenic pillars, these, these ideas that help us explain all of these together. And I think this is a really powerful figure. This is one of my favorites. I always joke that I'm going to get this as a tattoo somewhere on my body because I love it so much. And it was published in 2018 in Nature Immunology. And it's beautiful because not only does it have these pathogenic pillars, these ideas of, of what's going on underneath this, but it also puts it together in this very unique way as a cycle. So to me, this is really powerful. And I think this is maybe the most important thing I'll talk about tonight. So for those who are newly diagnosed with eczema, when they say to me, what is the root cause? What's the main problem? This is it. This is the root, 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 root. This is as deep as we can get, uh, I think, in this, maybe in this form of science. Much beyond that, I don't know, because it really is going to encompass a lot. I want to talk you through it. So the first thing to notice is that looking down, it's not just one thing. It's these really four, ultimately five things. We'll talk about why there are five things on here. And they're all deeply connected. So at the at the end of the day, atopic dermatitis or eczema, it's not just a thing. It's actually, it's a process. It's a vicious cycle that's happening over and over and over. People are spinning, it's moving. And that's part of why it's so tricky, I think, to treat. So let's start at the top. The top is talking about the skin barrier. And we know that generally speaking, every patient that has eczema, their skin barrier is weakened. I like to use the term leaky skin. Their skin is actually leaky. Water gets out too easily. And then allergens and irritants and even bacteria and viruses, they can get in too easily. When that happens, this causes a great imbalance. So if we kind of follow it counterclockwise, we go to that next one at the nine o'clock position, the microbiota. So the bacteria on our skin gets all disrupted. When the barrier starts falling apart, this makes a mess of everything. And what happens is that generally speaking, some of the bad guys like Staphylococcus aureus, staph bacteria takes over. And it loves this because it actually now can dominate and release a number of toxins. And they've identified a number of these toxins, things like delta toxin and alpha toxin. Those toxins released by the bacteria, you see it arrow going down, it calls the immune system. Our poor immune system is like, wait, there's bacteria going crazy on the skin. What is happening? And so it rushes over there to try to help. It's trying to fight the bacteria. It's releasing these things called cytokines, these inflammatory mediators, these messengers. And we see those IL-4 and IL-13. Those guys are designed to help not only calm more inflammation around, but they're supposed to help fight these infections. But part of what they do is you can see they point up to the 12 o'clock position, they damage the barrier. So they actually are making the problem worse. I kind of think about it as if, imagine if your doors and windows were broken off, they're wide open. And bad guys kept coming into the house to steal stuff and you keep calling the police and they keep coming and they're trampling over the floor and smashing stuff up and having, you know, all this violence in your house. You're like, oh my goodness, this is terrible. And it's like, how do we stop this? Well, we have to fix the doors and windows. That's going to be something that's going to help restore the barrier. But right now everything's crazy. There's police in your house. There's all the stuff falling apart. Okay. The next part is we see that that goes two ways. Not only does it go to destroy the skin barrier, but it also 
activates our sensory nerves, the nerves in the skin, they respond to IL-4, IL-13, and what sometimes is called the master itch cytokine, IL-31. So what does that mean? You feel incredibly itchy. And what do you do when you're itch, when you feel itchy? You scratch. And that's what that hand is doing. The, the behavioral part, the scratching, the rubbing, sometimes even inadvertently, sometimes in your sleep or when you're falling asleep, this is not blaming anybody. This is what you do. It's what it is designed. To, it makes you want to scratch. So people scratch. Well, what does that do? It further damages the barrier. So we have all of these things happening, these five things, the barrier, the microbiome being messed up, the immune system going crazy, the nerve endings themselves being overstimulated and actually changing over time. And then the behavioral piece or the mind body piece, and they keep playing into each other. Now, here's the kicker. No matter where you start on this vortex, you can get the cycle going. You could start with just feeling itchy. So that's how we could think maybe if a certain food is one of your triggers, the food doesn't necessarily cause your eczema, but maybe it makes it kind of itchy. And then bam, you're in the cycle. It could start with behavior. Sometimes, especially my teenagers, sometimes they'll start, they'll start scratching during the visit. I'll be like, are you itchy? And they're like, no, I just kind of do that when I'm anxious. So the behavioral piece, uh, it could start with the immune system. We know when people get sick, they get a cold, they get a sore throat, their immune system ramps up their eczema flares. Well, that's the immune system. And it can happen if you start with your barrier. What if you, you know, use a product that's irritating, right? That can totally irritate, break down your barrier, too harsh of a cleanser or a soap, bam, you're in it. So once this goes, you're in trouble and it's really hard to stop it. And any one thing to stop it might not be enough. You can turn off the immune system as best you can or kind of quiet it down, but all these other things are still raging. You could try to stop the itch, but again, if everything else is still raging, it's just a matter of time. So this is this is the secret of the whole thing. And this is why I think it's so tricky. And this is why uh, it's really, really difficult to, uh, to talk about it as well. And it turns out that each one of those five things we talked about is kind of a world unto themselves. There's so many complex aspects of it. And anybody who says it's really easy, well, they either are fibbing or they don't really know. You know, I think they just, they don't really understand how complex it all is. That doesn't mean that we can't fix it. We can't help it, but it does mean that it, it's pretty tricky. And so this is a, an image of thinking about the skin barrier, how complex even just that barrier, that top piece is, because it has not only the physical aspects of the barrier, it has the different cells and the fats between the cells and all the little connecting proteins, but it also has certain chemicals that have to be present. It has to be acidic. The skin has something called the acid mantle, and that's really important to protect us. And it turns out that if that pH, the, the pH of the skin, if it gets too alkaline, we get in big trouble and staph grows like crazy, staph bacteria. We also need things like natural moisturizing factor, certain lipids like the ceramides, beta defensins, cathelicidins, all these pieces of the puzzle. So this is this is why I think it's so tricky and why it probably it's true that one size doesn't fit all. Now, all of this is even scarier because not only is eczema terrible by itself, right? It's unpleasant, it's you know really uncomfortable, and it looks, for many patients, it looks in a, in a way that's making them upset just to see it, right? To see their skin like that. But it turns out that it's not just limited to the skin. We think that there is a real reason to help treat it because if we don't, those allergens that can get through the damaged skin barrier could potentially make you allergic to things in the environment, including foods. So this is the big idea about what's called epicutaneous or transcutaneous, meaning in the skin or through the skin, sensitization to develop food allergies, that you have broken skin, food particles are in the environment. It's in the dust. It's just around, right? If somebody has had peanut butter in the house, it's actually, there's little peanut particles everywhere. If it touches the skin, it goes into that broken barrier and can actually make you allergic. So that's why I often tell my patients and my families, if they're very treatment, if they're kind of nervous about treatment and, and treatment phobic, say, I don't really want to use anything. We're afraid of everything. I say, I hear you. I wish we didn't have to either. I don't want to use any medicines, but I'm really worried that by walking around the world with open, essentially open skin, we are going to then develop some allergies. Now, this is not, I would say, not 100% proven, right? This is still some ideas about this, but I think we understand enough about it to say, uh oh, this makes some really good sense and also explains why food allergies are going crazy as well. It turns out that if you eat the foods early on, generally speaking, we can help prevent those allergies. Now, again, not perfect, lots of question marks, but that's the whole big exciting story about how they found that babies in Israel had very low levels of peanut allergy. And it turns out that there's a, a teething snack that little babies eat, these little peanut butter snacks. They're kind of peanut puffs. They're actually kind of good. They taste taste kind of like, like Captain Crunch peanut butter cereal kind of thing. And it turns out that seems to be protective. So 
we're understanding this. And of course, there are some studies now showing that taking care of the skin, treating the skin appropriately, keeping the eczema from getting bad really does seem to decrease food allergy. So this really seems to, you know, it's a hypothesis, but it looks like it actually bears out. And this is pretty exciting. This is just actually from, from last month. So showing that enhanced skin treatment, better skin treatment for atopic dermatitis really does reduce food allergy. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. I've been waiting for this paper for a long time. So I'm excited about this and excited to share it with you. But why do we have all this barrier damage? You said it's not just genetics. What else could be causing this? Well, it turns out that one of the things that might be causing it is pollution. Some of the things in our environment and in our air. And I think this is some exciting work. This is done. Part of this work is done at the National Institutes of Health. And I think this is fascinating because they're showing that certain types of pollutants are associated with more eczema. In particular, these things called diisocyanates that are present, among other things, they're present in car exhaust. They're present in when there's wildfires. You know, I mean, that, that, that smoke is not great for our, not only is it not great for our lungs, but not great for our skin. It damages the barrier, but it also affects our bacteria, the microbiome. So really interesting to see this. And this might explain it uh, to, for some, because we know, for example, that in the wake of the California wildfires, there's been an increase of atopic dermatitis, even in adults. Now, the other big breakthrough came from Dr. Heidi Kong. This is now over a decade ago, but it's still, it's still the repercussions are being felt that staph bacteria is not just a, an opportunist. It's not just waiting for the door to be open to cause trouble. It turns out that it actually is one of the drivers of disease. So when there is a lot of staph on your skin, it can actually push you towards eczema. And that's really powerful too, because that has really changed our thinking. I was taught that it's just something sitting around. If the skin gets inflamed or open, then staff can take advantage of it. But now we're thinking, huh, maybe we need to treat this a little bit more aggressively. And of course, it's not just the bacteria on the skin, but it's the bacteria all throughout our body, including in our gut. And it turns out that the microbiome is really complex. It's a really another organ system. And, and we're still, I would say medicine is still trying to figure out how to wrap our head around this because it's all happening so fast. And we really didn't know, we had no idea how important this was. Uh, but it turns out lots of things can affect our microbiome. So we talked about some of those environmental toxins. Those are bad uh, for the microbiome, but also stress, sleep deprivation, Okay. We know that even things like noise can affect it. So people live in cities, lots of loud noise that affects our microbiome. And of course, our physical activity level in our diet. So all of these things are playing a role. And as we saw in that diagram, all it takes is one thing to start it and the domino effect happens. And that's why I think it's so tough to treat for some patients, especially when it gets really bad. We know that it can present differently in different skin types. And so one of the things I think people are really focused on is how do we make sure that we're really giving the correct diagnosis, giving the correct sense of severity and understanding control that really meets everybody where they're at. So as we can see here in darker skin tones, it can be harder to appreciate redness. So I think there is this real danger. If your skin is darker, people don't see it as looking as bad, you know, because we said we're looking for redness. Well, if you have very dark skin, that redness is harder to see against the background of darker skin. And that's certainly not the fault of the patient, but it can be missed. It can be missed more easily. So we're really trying to tune in. And I think we're going away from looking at it and saying how bad it is, which not only is limited depending on the skin tone, but also it depends on the day. Sometimes patients come in and say, doc, I know I look good today, but I've been miserable. <laughs> the last two weeks have been terrible, but I look a little better today. You're going to tell me that I'm not severe. I think it's the wrong question. And so what we're moving towards now is this thing called the ADCT and things like it. These are called patient reported outcomes. I love this. It's six questions. And I have my patients do it a lot because it takes about only one minute. You can do it in like 45 seconds. And it's just the six questions. Over the last week, how would you rate your eczema-related symptoms? Over the last week, how many days did you have intense episodes of itching because of your eczema? Over the last week, how bothered have you been by your eczema? Over the last week, how many nights did you have trouble falling or staying asleep because of your eczema? Over the last week, how much did your eczema affect your daily activities? And over the last week, how much did your eczema affect your mood or emotions? And then you just rate them and you put it together. And the goal for someone to be under control is to be under seven points. So if you're, you know, basically zero through six, you're generally considered control unless you get one of those answers in a blue box. So it's really, it's the big one is, um, is, is sleep. So even one night of, of bad sleep is probably means you're not under good control. And this is powerful. And I'll tell you, I've had a number of patients where we start the visit and they're smiling and they say, you know, I think I'm doing pretty good. And we do these questions and they get like an 18 and then they start crying. 
and they go, oh my goodness, I don't think I'm doing very good. I'm like, I know. And that's why I asked the questions because I said, you know what? You're tough. You are a warrior. You're so used to dealing with this. You thought you were doing good. And in a way you are, you're doing relatively good for you, but that's not good enough. We need to have you comfortable. We need to have you sleeping well, because as we saw, even things like sleep disruption and stress, that can make everything worse. So you these loops upon loops upon loops. So what are the goals? What are the treatment goals? What is reasonable treatment? Well, the first thing is we have to get people clear. We have to get the skin healed. That is usually relatively easy to do. Sometimes easier said than done, but usually we can get the skin clear. The hard parts are the next two hurdles because these are the three big ones. Getting you clear, we can do usually. Keeping you clear safely, really hard. And keeping it up, really hard. I have patients who they have a good regimen, they're doing pretty well, but they're like, oh, I'm exhausted. I'm so tired of all this stuff. I feel like my steps, every single day, I have 25,000 things to do with my skin. I just can't handle it. That's, that's important to know. Okay. Or keeping clear patient comes in and says, no, I'm pretty good. I just use this one pound jar of triamcinolone every week all over the place. And I'm like, uh, that, no, that's not safe. <laughs> we can't, we can't just keep using the super strong medicines over and over and over. That's not how they're designed. That's not good for you. We're going to get into trouble. And, you know, fortunately, most of the time we catch that very early, but we have to be constantly vigilant. So there are some really nice approaches to thinking about this. And the idea really is that it is a dynamic condition. We're going to treat where you're at. So we're, we're asking and checking in and seeing what patient needs. And I'm really changing my treatment approach every visit. We're seeing what works, what doesn't. And we're trying to find the right set of things to help people get better. And we always start with sort of the basic things, which part of it is right here, education. We want patients to have a sense of what's going on, why things are being the way they are, and the general sense of the landscape, what kinds of things can we do? Gentle bathing, good moisturization. Obviously, if we know there are allergens or irritants, things that are making it worse, by all means, we want to get rid of those things and avoid them. That's the baseline. For real mild people, that might be all they need. If that's not enough, then we would go up to something a little bit more medicated, like usually a topical steroid or a non-steroidal medicine every now and then. And for some people, that's all. They go, oh, I use my cream once in a while and I'm fine. Okay, pretty safe. But if that's not enough, then we can go up even higher. We can do some of the other non-steroidals. We even have our new, our newer medicine our topical jack inhibitor. Uh, so we have some new exciting things on uh, out there on our menu. And then of course, if it's still not enough, then we can go to the most powerful things that we have. Things like phototherapy, the light treatment, some of the systemic agents. We have both the shots and the pills. We even have situations where I'll have patients, I'll hospitalize them. I'll say, we just you just need a lot of support. Now, starting at the bottom, we know that moisturization generally works. Now, does it work 100% of the time for everybody? No, everybody's a bit different. But most patients, if they find a moisturizer that suits them, they really, really do better. So that's why we really encourage it. And sometimes my patients are like, oh, you're like a broken record. All you talk about is moisturizing. And I said, because it really works for a lot of people, it decreases their eczema severity. And what I love about it is that it's very, very safe and it's relatively inexpensive and it makes sense, right? We're supporting the skin barrier. A good moisturizer often is also supporting the microbiome. They often, because of that, they're cooling the inflammation, cooling the itch. It's really cool. So it makes a lot of sense to do that. And many people ask me, is there a best moisturizer? And the answer is, no, <laughs> long answer, no. There's just lots of different flavors. So, so long as we're in a group of moisturizers that are helpful, I think, for the patient. And I think we, ideally we use things like, um, you know, of course, the, the National Eczema Association has the seal of acceptance, which is really neat, which kind of looks at products and helps, helps us decide which ones might be good. That can be very, very helpful to pick from that group. But I think everybody has kind of their own favorites. And I usually give a, a few different suggestions and I really want feedback for patients. Oh, that was too, too greasy. I didn't like it. I'll give something else to try. And if they say, oh, that was, that stung and burned, then we'll try something else. We got to try to find something that fits. There was a big question uh, and still is a question to some degree about bathing. Should I bathe every day? Should I not bathe very much? Well, it turns out in the old days, especially when soaps were harsh and even just plain water is kind of harsh for your skin because it pulls oils. It made sense to say, you know, don't bathe too much. Just bathe once in a while. And that makes sense. And you'll still hear many people talk about that. But it turns out when you bathe with something gentle and you moisturize right after, sometimes it's called soak and seal or soak and smear, it turns out that it actually is better. They did a neat study and they found that the wet method, the more frequent bathing was significantly better. So done right for, again, for most patients, are there patients for whom this is not the right course? Absolutely. And that again, is part of the problem. It's not one size fits all. So it's really getting 
getting a chance to try things. And I usually tell patients that this is our first move. It's like an opening move in the game of chess. It doesn't mean, you know, that's, this is far from checkmate. We have to do, we have to see what's going to happen. We have to see what, what the skin is going to do and, and how it's going to feel for you and all of those things. It turns out that we also can use a preventative or proactive approach. And this is usually done with a non-steroidal agent because one of our big fears is we don't want to overuse topical steroids. They can be very effective. But they also have a whole bunch of problems that can happen if we overuse them. And so some of the things people have done is said, well, what if we use a non-steroidal, in this case, it's tacrolimus, the, the calcineurin inhibitor type medicine twice a week. And this is the work of Andreas Wollenberg, who's a dermatologist and allergist in Munich, Germany. And he was able to show when patients did that just twice a week. So you could do it on the weekends. Maybe some people do it like a Monday and a Wednesday. They put it to the trouble spots. And it decreased their number of flare-ups. It actually improved their quality of life. It way decreased the amount of steroids they used. It was great. It just takes some time and energy to talk about how to do it, how to do it safely, and so on. One of the other problems with uh, some of our non-steroidal agents, even though I try to use them a lot, is that they can sting and burn sometimes. So some of the little pearls we have are using the steroid first for a couple of days to cool it down if it's really irritated. Sometimes we'll even say put a moisturizer on before applying the steroid sparing agent, you know, the non-steroidal. So we have some other little tips and tricks that we can use in certain situations if a patient, you know, really still wants to try to use them. And again, I encourage them. I try to minimize my steroid use whenever I can. And then finally, I think what we're really trying to do is put it all together in a cohesive way so that people know what to do. And I, I do this a lot. And some patients are like, okay, thanks. Other patients are like, whoa, no one's ever written it out for me before like this. This is so empowering. But for me, it's kind of selfish too, because I don't think I could explain just with words all the stuff to do. Like I have to have a little diagram and I can say, okay, look, this is when you're flaring up and this is when you're better. So when you're flaring up, maybe you'd use your steroid medicine, okay? And then I put a time limit. You're going to do that for a few days, maybe up to a week. Maybe some dermatologists say up to two weeks, but I really like to keep it fairly low amount of time with the steroid. And then when you're better, then we're going to maybe switch to our non-steroidal agent, or maybe if it's milder, just moisturizer. But you have this idea of back and forth. And then one of my favorite things to recommend lately is the Eczema Wise app. And this was actually developed by our friends at the National Eczema Association. It's wonderful. It's totally free. You can get it on both iOS and on Android. And what I love about it is it helps not only with some of the basic stuff in here, it has lots of educational pieces, but it helps people keep track of their plan and of their skin. And that is really, really cool. So I love to, to work with patients and have them kind of keep track of things and kind of come back and report because what I say is, listen, especially families who are worried about steroids, are like, well, how do you know I'm not going to overuse them? And I said, well, listen, we're going to follow up in just a few weeks. And if we feel like the pattern is going the wrong direction, then I promise you, we are going to change. We're going to, you know, we're not going to let it go that way. Uh, and and that's the, that's the real key. And, and of course that takes two. It, it really, we have to keep those follow-up appointments and keep on each other. We have to keep an eye out. And that really brings us to the future. Where are things going? And I think what's so exciting right now is that finally we have new options for patients that are not doing well with what we've had historically. So we saw that chart. We have our topical agents, then we have the phototherapy, we have some of the biologic agents that are out in some of these new pills. But there are a whole bunch of new ideas. And what I what I call this is this is the virtuous cycle of drug development with each new medicine, especially these more tailored medicines, we learn more about the condition too. So we've learned just an exponential amount about atopic dermatitis because some of these more targeted treatments really do work. And we also are learning about their side effects, like what, what, what don't they do well? And then can we fine tune it? So we're seeing each generation get more and more interesting and better. So I'm really, really excited. I think we are going to have new tools and they're coming. Like there are, some of them are here. Some of them are coming around the corner. And this has really changed the way we think about it. Not only does it, it really it allows us to treat more people, to get people better than ever before, but most importantly, it allows us to do so in a really safe way. I think we're seeing patients get the best treatment that I've ever seen and in a way that is safer than anything we've used before. So much so that part of the educational mission is to remind people that some of the things that we're comfortable with, the things that have been around for a long time, you know, we're comfortable with them, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're safe. So comparing apples to apples. And I think that's important too, because the newer medicines are under a lot more scrutiny. So you often see these terrible things about them. But if we really go back and look, we say, oh, well, actually some of the old stuff maybe wasn't as safe as we thought. You know, it's, it's a little bit, I, I sometimes say like the person who says, I'm afraid to fly in a plane those things are dangerous and then gets on the motorcycle without their helmet. You say, 
wait a minute, you know, I know you're in control of that motorcycle and you feel safer, but it's maybe not safer in, in the big picture. So really trying to weigh all that. And that's hard to do because, you know, each patient is different and each scenario is a little bit different. So all that being said, I think the things that we want to take home with us are that it's tough. It is not your fault. You didn't do anything to get this. And there is tremendous amount of hope. We have new approaches, new ideas, new treatments to push back. If anybody has it, Checking out the EczemaWise app is so important. Check out that atopic dermatitis control tool. It's totally free. You can print it out. You can bring it to your appointment and you can show them. And the most important thing I think is finding a partner to help on the journey, right? This is a really hard thing. And it's, again, I wish it were easy. I always joke, nobody wants my job. You know, everybody wants, there's a glamorous side of dermatology. It's not glamorous, right? It's really hard. And it really means listening to people who have had a rough night, a rough week, a rough month, a rough life, right? And and I think my job is really just to do the best I can in shepherding people to get them some relief. And I really like this is um this is actually Hippocrates who said, life is short and art long, opportunity fleeting, experimentations perilous and judgment difficult. And I think that summarizes medicine, which is what he was talking about here, but also atopic dermatitis, that it is tough to treat it and tough to be on this journey. But I really think that together we can do great things. So thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed that. And now I think we have some time for questions. Yes, we have a ton of really awesome questions. So let's get right to them. First one is, what kind of doctor should I see for my eczema? A primary care doctor? I've also heard I should go to a dermatologist or allergist. Yeah, so obviously I'm biased. I'm a dermatologist, um, but I really do think this is really the dermatologist disease. This is our wheelhouse more than anyone else. Now, some insurance plans make you see your primary care doctor first, and some primary care doctors are really good, especially for milder disease. They could do a great job. Usually they will refer when it's appropriate. So a lot of times people will start there, but if you can, I really do think seeing a dermatologist is the best. Most of my patients though, especially because they're pretty severe, they also have an allergist. So allergists are incredibly helpful as well. And in some communities, I'm told our dermatologist doesn't really take care of eczema or they don't take care of kids. They mostly do skin cancer or, or surgery or whatnot. So in that case, an allergist can be a wonderful person to take care of it. But I will say, I think dermatologists are the one They're That's really, it's our wheelhouse. Great. Does eczema lead to other health problems? Yes, there are many. So there are both allergic comorbidities, things that come along with it. And that includes things, some of what we talked about tonight, like food allergies, asthma is more common in patients with eczema and things like hay fever as well. All of those things seem to be connected. And then there are non-allergic comorbidities, things that go along with it. And there's a whole host of them, but they include the mental health issues like ADHD. That's one of the things, depression, anxiety. We also know that some other kind of strange stuff is connected too. There was a, a report about an increased risk of bone fractures and an increased risk of heart disease. So some of those are a little bit more tenuous, but I think there, there are a lot of things that can come along with eczema. And I truly think, particularly if it's not well-controlled, it puts our body in a lot of trouble because there's chronic inflammation. So do you recommend bleach baths or vinegar baths to help take care of staff? So honestly, neither. It turns out neither one kills staff. Shocker. Okay. So listen to this. There has been a whole bunch of papers suggesting that the bleach baths as we recommend them are about 10 times too weak to actually kill staff. And you don't want to make it 10 times stronger. It'll burn your skin. So the bleach that we can use on our skin is very diluted. It has to be so as not to hurt the skin. And it probably is a little bit anti-inflammatory and maybe anti-itch and maybe helps the barrier, but it doesn't actually kill staff. Uh, it turns out vinegar also probably doesn't kill staff at the dosage that we're using. So we need to, for that particular question, we need to go a different way. That being said, I do use bleach baths sometimes in my practice and some of the bleach sprays, they make those hypochlorous acid sprays, basically a bleach uh, derivative and a spray. Um, those can be helpful, but not for the reason we think. So how do we kill staff? That's for another webinar. <laughs> okay. Another staff question for you. What should you do if a staff infection won't go away? So I think the most important thing is seeing somebody who is going to help you solve the problem because there are kind of two ways to think about that, that issue. First of all, you can have an infection, a true infection, which can be life-threatening staff can, can kill you. Uh, so you have to make sure that 
if we're worried about an actual staph infection, it's getting treatment. And if, if it's not going away, then you need to be hospitalized to get IV antibiotics and, and so on. So that's the extreme version. I'll bet you didn't mean that. I'll bet you mean more of a colonization. You keep growing staph when they culture you. Well, that is really hard, if not impossible for most patients, because some of my patients say, well, doctor, why aren't you culturing my skin again? And I say, because once you've had it, you have eczema, you pretty much are always going to have it. And so it won't affect my treatment because I know you're going to grow staff on your skin. So in that case, we don't really know, but there are some interesting tools that people are exploring right now. One of them, there's an enzyme that's in a moisturizer that can potentially kill staff. We'll see if this really works. There are different types of probiotics that are topically being used. Try to put the good guys on the skin and push back against staff. There are those hypochlorous acid sprays we talked about. So all these things, but there's not much data on this. And even one of the things I'm a big fan of, Dr. Aaron's compound, I don't know if people have heard of that, where you actually kind of mix in an antibacterial to your cortisone and your moisturizer. It turns out that probably also doesn't kill staph. And again, very little evidence about this, but we did a small study on it and it seems to help our patients. So again, all these are, these are two different questions, right? Helping the eczema versus killing the staph. So we're really focusing on that question of killing staph, but Dr. Aaron's compound probably is not strong enough to kill staph because it's so dilute, but it still helps. And so part of the trick is getting the skin better and getting in better for a long period of time. So we have actually a question about the Aaron regimen. Uh, what are your thoughts on it? So I'm a big fan. If you Google Aaron regime and my name, you'll see a bunch of papers I've written about it. Uh, it is a, a bit of a controversial position. Uh, many of my colleagues don't like it. They, they're kind of skeptical, but I do think people have softened up to it and warmed up to it over time. Um, I really think it works. I don't know why though. It doesn't make sense. It, it's one of those things when I first recommended it to my first patient, they found it. They said, can we try this? And I was like, yeah, but it's really diluted. I don't think it's going to do anything. It's kind of like dilute stuff. And what, just for those who don't know, it's a cortisone mixed into a moisturizer with also some antibacterial, usually mupirocin. And they're just mixed together. A pharmacy usually does this compounding pharmacy. Nobody makes money on it. I mean, one of the things I wrote a paper about it and somebody, I think it was somebody from the UK said, well, this is clearly like a money grab or something I'm like money. Who? Nobody makes money on it. I, I write the prescription. I don't make money on the prescription. The pharmacy, I guess the compounding pharmacy, but they're local compounding pharmacies. So there's no one pharmacy that does it. And it's not terribly expensive. In fact, the one we've been using recently, um, they are mail order. And it, I think it costs the patient like $45 cash pay. Insurance isn't even involved. It's not even costing the healthcare system any. But all that being said, I do think it can be helpful for a lot of patients. I do think we have to be careful though, because they're still steroid. And I have some patients who just kind of use it all the time. And I, I'm not comfortable with that. I'm still a little more conservative. I don't like chronic, you know, kind of chronic continuous steroid use. I think it's a recipe for trouble for some patients. Thank you. So is wet wrapping recommended for pediatric patients? Yeah, all the time. It's a powerful technique. Wet wrap is basically at, usually at night, but it can be done anytime you you take your bath or your shower, you put your medicine or just moisturizer, depending on, you know, the, the regimen you're doing, but it can be a medicine like a cortisone. And then you put a damp layer of clothing on it. It could be a wrap just in an area, which is what it comes, but it also can be like a full suit. We have little babies put on a onesie that's damp and it feels gross. It's cold and wet and gross, but then you put a nice dry layer on, you keep the room toasty warm. What does that do? Well, the cold of the water uh, not only cools the skin down and feels really good, but it also pushes the medicine deeply in and keeps the skin hydrated, which means it's more permissive. So we actually get a lot more medicine uptake. It's extremely powerful. It can work great, but it's more dangerous. You are pushing a lot more medicine in. So it's a very kind of unnatural way and it's not an FDA approved way to use it, but we do use it. We just have to be real careful with it because you absorb a lot more. Great. Next question, will the skin barrier strengthen over time if we are able to stay clear or will it mostly always be as low as, as it was low due to having eczema? Yeah, we really think that over time it will strengthen. Now, some people have a primary problem with their barrier. There are certain genes that people are have a mutation in. One of the big ones we learned about is called filaggrin. So this filaggrin protein is a skin barrier protein. It's doing a bunch of things and people that have a mutation in it, they're way more likely to get eczema. So even if we get their skin clear, they're probably still susceptible, but there's no doubt that when the inflammation's raging and you know, as we saw in that cycle, it's way worse. So we can get it better, but maybe never perfect, but that's okay. We can compensate for that. And that's part of, again, why I'm such a big fan of moisturizers, because if you don't make enough natural filaggrin to do its job, we think we can probably help or at least compensate to some degree with a moisturizer. Now, would I prefer that you didn't need one? Yes, of course I'd prefer it. I mean, I don't want anyone to need any medicine, but, but it's better to have to just use some moisturizer to keep your skin happy than have to use all these medicines, right? Okay. A couple of product questions here. 
What should you do if your skin begins flaring from your safe products, such as basic moisturizer and emollient? So a couple of things. I think the first thing is, you know, there's a chance you could become truly allergic to something over time. That really does happen. Even trusted things you've used for a long time, you can get allergic. The other thing is just trying to figure out, is there something else going on? So I talk about this idea of a threshold a lot. And usually I talk about in terms of diet, but it's equally applicable here. Patients will say, no matter what I eat, I flare up. I feel like I can't eat anything. And I'll say, well, listen, I think because your skin is so bad right now, it's at the top that you're right. Any little thing will push you over. So even a trusted emollient moisturizer base is driving you crazy. If we can control the skin and bring it back down, then we often find it's much more tolerant. So then I get people better and they're like, yeah, you know, I thought tomatoes made me worse, but now they're okay. And I thought that, you know, all these foods and I thought this cream, now I'm able to use it because I think when your skin is so angry, it's kind of like you get out of bed and you're in a terrible mood. Even if somebody says, good morning, you're like, Grr. but if you're in a great mood, and somebody says, you're a jerk. You're like, have a nice day. You know, like it rolls off you. Same thing with your skin. If your skin is angry, it's going to react more to things that I think when it's in a better state, it wouldn't. Love that analogy. That's great. All right. Is it normal to get hives with eczema? It's, it's not normal. It's definitely an abnormal thing, but it is not uncommon. A fair number of patients of mine do actually have hives as well. They are different branches of the immune system, and it would make me think that something else is going on. So most eczema patients probably don't have hives, um, and it would warrant some discussion. That's also the kind of situation where I would say, let's get an allergist involved too, because if you're getting hives, that's what's called the, the type 1 uh, kind of kind of inflammatory situation, the type one allergy that's IgE mediated, whereas atopic dermatitis is really considered more of a type four. It's T cells, so it's a slow poke system. So when you have both, it tells me there may be two things going on. Okay, why do topicals such as ointments, tacrolimus, eucrisa, stop working? So there are a couple of things. So typically they don't. That's the first thing I would say. For most of my patients, they really don't stop working. The, the most common thing I think we see is that the disease has gotten bad enough that they're just, you know, you're spiraling out and now you need something stronger uh, or a different approach, or there's something else that's causing trouble. You've gotten allergic to some component of it. You now have a bacterial infection. Um, I would say broadly speaking, sometimes people tell me that something's not working anymore and maybe they're using an old one, it's expired or something. But typically the, the concept of tachyphylaxis where a medicine works, 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 and then it stops working, it turns out it's actually pretty rare in dermatology with the kind of stuff we're talking about. Um, so I would say that would make me wonder what's going on. I would say, are we sure we're using the right strength? Are we sure the disease isn't going crazy? Have you gotten allergic to something? Is there an infection? I would really wonder something's up because that that's a it's pretty rare for it to be like that. Okay. Are there any safe or effective treatments for the skin thinning caused by steroids? Best thing is prevention. We really want to try to prevent it. If you have mild skin thinning and you stop, it should come back to normal. We just got to avoid the steroids. If you have really bad skin thin, you know, skin thinning and, at, and you have the atrophy and maybe the stria rubra, the stretch marks, it's really tough. Um, it is tough to fix that. So I'm I'm pretty vigilant against that. I, I really worry, if, especially if people are using it in sensitive areas, neck folds, you know, the armpits and groin area. We see some stretch marks there. Now, some people can get stretch marks just naturally. You know, I, I have kids who go through a growth spurt and have stretch marks. They weren't even and using steroids, but we know the steroids can really make that more likely. So we want to be vigilant. Does inexpensive hand lotion or body lotion help with eczema symptoms, mainly itching? I mean, yeah, it can. So a moisturizer doesn't have to be expensive. Um, when you preface it with inexpensive, I'm not sure what that means. Like, you know, maybe a really crummy one you bought at a gas station, maybe a lot of real cheap products, you know, they, they have kind of, they're mostly water-based, they're more lotion. Uh, many cheap products have fragrance, you know, they have cheaper ingredients, so they might not be the best. That being said, I have patients who tell me they spent $150 on some fancy schmancy imported moisturizer. And I'm like, uh, that we don't have to do that. Like, you know, I don't even, there's not even evidence that it's any better. So I think there's just kind of a middle range of things that are usually pretty affordable and have a good history. And again, many of them carry the seal. That's a great guide because sometimes pa patients will say, well, can you, can you give me a list of ones to try? And I'll say, that's, that's my favorite. Look at the guide uh, from the National Eczema Association. But yeah, in general, they shouldn't be too expensive, even, you know, even for all price points. I mean, there are, there are moisturizers that are, inexpensive. I mean, good old plain, hydrated petrolatum, you know, basically Vaseline, you can get the generic version of Vaseline. And that for some people is great. And that's very inexpensive. Great. Okay. Is it dangerous to take biologics and jack inhibitors long-term? Does it permanently suppress or affect your immune system over time? 
Are there chances of de developing cancer due to that potential change in the immune system? Yeah, so let's let's start with the biologics. So the, we, we really only have two biologics right now for atopic dermatitis. We have dupilumab, right? And then we have trilokinumab. We have a third one that's very similar coming called lebrokizumab. They're, they're all pretty much the same pathway, same kind of thing. So we think, as far as we can tell, there is no increased cancer risk, which is great. There's no increased infection risk with those, which is great too. They're not really suppressing your immune system. In fact, the FDA, who's very strict about stuff like this, they don't mess around. They allow them to say they're not immunosuppressant which is kind of a big deal. I remember when they first announced that there were some people who kind of like shocked, like, wait a minute, how are they get to say that? And it's because they're so targeted. So my sense is that the long-term safety of them, and you know, they've only been out, Dupilumab's only been out for six years. So how much can you say? I can't, obviously, I wish I could say in the future, but we still find new things out about Tylenol, you know, things that have been with us for 30, 40 years, you still learn stuff. So we're always having to learn. The FDA is really all about that. They want to keep collecting data and they'll keep adding to these safety lists. But everything we know so far seems that at least for a few years, they look pretty darn safe. And most of the things that happen with the biologic agents seem to be more tolerability. They're more irritations, you know, just new nu nuisances like the eye issue, the head and neck stuff. They usually are not very dangerous, which is great. Now there are some dangerous things that can happen. You can be allergic to them and so on and so forth. The JAK inhibitors are a little bit different they are a little bit broader. So they are suppressing your immune system. That's why we have to do blood work. We have to check for tuberculosis before and hepatitis before. Uh, and yes, there is a connection with increased risk of cancer for those, especially in the long term. Now, what level is that? It's really hard to say. It's probably really, really, really tiny, uh, especially for otherwise healthy people with atopic derm, we think but we don't really know. So there's definitely more trepidation, I think, for the, the JAK inhibitor pills because there's more potential risk. That being said, for the patients who are really severe, they're a godsend, you know? And, and I always tell my patients, we're not gonna do it for life. We're gonna do it for a while to get you better. And then we're gonna maybe try something else. So I don't necessarily feel like people have to be on this kind of stuff forever. We can rotate and try different things. And for some patients, we can get them better. They're in a real bad place. We can do something for a short period and rotate them off to do something different for a while. That all being said, let us not forget, I alluded to it earlier, that things like prednisone and cyclosporine and methotrexate, which have been used for many, many decades, they have a really high risk of infection and a really high risk of cancer and a really high risk of all these other things comparatively. So it's not to say that the JAK inhibitors are totally safe. That's false. They're not totally safe. Nothing's totally safe, but they're relatively speaking, probably the lesser of the evils. And that's confusing because we don't hear the same messaging around prednisone. People say prednisone. I took it when I had poison ivy. It's fine. Right. It's like, mm, it's okay. We still use it. Right. It's not even that bad that the FDA has pulled the drug, right. It's still out there. You can still get prednisone. It's inexpensive, but when you really look at the longer term data, it's maybe not as safe as you thought. And these JAK inhibitors comparatively are probably, well, I would I would say without any question are no worse. And in my opinion, are much, much safer than prednisone, as crazy as it sounds. Uh, what percentage of kids will outgrow eczema? We think on the order of two thirds of kids will outgrow their eczema or get significantly better in time. There seems to be at least about a third of the patients that have some more trouble, but it's probably not evenly distributed. Honestly, I think the reason it's like a third, a third and a third kind of thing is because that's roughly the breakdown of mild, moderate, and severe. I think that the more mild cases, they tend to grow out of it. The more severe cases don't. So it's it's not entirely fair. The poor, the kids who are miserable are the ones asking that question like, oh good, maybe you know, two thirds chance I'll grow out of it, but maybe not. Probably for those kids, they they're more likely to keep it. Here's another pediatrics question specific to the environment. Do we know how prevalent the environment factor is? It just seems interesting that my son developed eczema at three months old when he hasn't been exposed to the environment that long when he's so young. Yeah, I mean, we know it's playing a big role. Here's the thing, right? The Most kids develop it in the first couple of years of life. Um, so it's not weird at all to develop it in the first few months of life. That's when we see it. But yeah, the environment is complex too. It probably has to do with the parent's environment to some degree as well. There are some maternal factors that play a role, um, but it is weird. Yeah, I mean, it's really weird. And you know, I have patients who say, well, I'm gonna move to a different climate, but we see it in all climates. You know, People always say, I'm gonna move to Florida where it's humid, but Florida has a ton of bad eggs my cases. I mean, I hear it whenever I lecture down there, they're like, trust me, it's, it's terrible, you know, and for those patients, maybe they don't have to worry about the winter eczema, but they don't really get much of a winter in South Florida, but the heat of summer, they're miserable. So it seems complex. Mm -hmm. Are breastfed babies like less likely to get eczema and allergies? You sure would think so, right? 
but it turns out most of the studies we have do not show a protective effect. It's fascinating. You really would expect it. Same thing with C-section versus vaginal delivery. It's about the same. Now, I think there was a more recent study that maybe showed a little discrepancy, but there are a bunch of studies that didn't show it. So there may be some effect, but it's not very strong. And that's shocking. It's one of those interesting things. I was like, wow, we really expect that to help. I still think breastfeeding is really good. I think it's good for, for the babies uh, in general. It's probably the best way to go if you can, but amazingly, even if you don't, it doesn't really increase the risk that much. At least it's hard to measure. All right. Here's a question about the sun. Is the sun helpful? For, for, is the sun helpful maybe for short times? Yeah, in general, you know, sunlight is really good for atopic dermatitis. Um, and that's kind of how we learned about phototherapy. Uh, with phototherapy, the light therapy, we're basically using a filtered sunlight. That's a UV light. The problem with the sun is a couple things. Number one is it also has other wavelengths that are damaging. The UVA spectrum is not that good for our skin. It can increase the risk of cancers and melanoma and all this kind of stuff. So we try to avoid it. Number two, typically the sun brings with it heat. So the overheating can be really uncomfortable for patients. They can sweat and that can also be a trigger. So again, with the light therapy, we get rid of the heat, we get rid of the bad rays. And so you just get the good rays in there. That being said, you know, some patients do really well in the summer, but others have trouble and we just have to be really careful. We don't want to overdo it. And in a place like Chicago, it's also incredibly random. You know, you might have six months of just very little sun. So it's not something we can count on here, but in some sunny places, you certainly can. Here's a, a very specific question. Oh, my toddler has bumps on her face and arms. We attempt two times daily body cream and ointment for, on the face. She fights the cream applications. Why is it irritating to her? I mean, I think some some little kids just really hate people putting stuff on them. You know, it can just feel unpleasant. It doesn't even have to be the actual cream itself. Just the act of, you know, toddlers are defiant sometimes. And they're just like, get off me. I don't want you putting stuff on me. It's weird. Um, so I, I respect that. You know, I, I wouldn't want someone to hold me down and put something on me. Um, I think part of it may just be trying to find something that is nice for for the for the baby and and trying different different uh, types of moisturizers. Ones that feel good. Sometimes if it's cold, they don't like it. So you can warm it up in your hands a little bit. We'll say for little kids who really hate the cold, you can, if you have a jar of moisturizer, tighten it up, make sure it's real tight. And then you could put it in the bathtub with the kids to kind of warm up in the tub, just the warm water kind of gently warms it so that when you take it out, it's actually nice and warm and doesn't feel as, as cold to the skin. Some of those little tricks can help. And then we would always ask the question, if it's bumps on the face and arms, is this just keratosis pilaris and not really eczema? And if that's the case, is it not really bothering the kids? So maybe we shouldn't bother the kid if we don't need to. That's always a question, you know, we'll ask. The KP bothers the parents much more than the kids. Um, and so that's something to think about. Can taking probiotics help eczema? So yes, we think so. So not only can taking probiotics, if the mom, an expectant mother is taking the probiotics, it does seem to decrease the risk of developing eczema or at least delay the eczema in babies, which is kind of cool. But for kids, and especially babies and kids, if they take probiotics, they seem to be able to decrease their symptoms as well. Now, this is again, controversial. So depending on how you talk to, you might hear people more dismissive of it, but I really do think there is... Um, pretty good data. And we, we looked at a recent meta-analysis and it really does come on the side of saying that probiotics are probably helpful, but there's still a billion questions. Which one or ones, I think the secret is multiple strains, mixed strains of probiotics, what dosage, which brand, how often to take it, right? All of these are questions. So we don't know. And the studies are all different. So it's like, how, how do you, how do you do it? But I do think there's something to it. Okay. It looks like we have time for a couple more questions here. Did you say that an illness can be what starts eczema initially or just what starts a flare? More of a flare, but yeah, certainly it can kind of unmask it. You know, I mean, there's always got to be a first time. So yeah, I think that would be reasonable. It's not that it caused it, but it could be the first time it kind of presents itself. But more typically, it's just something that makes it worse. Sometimes even after vaccines, you know, people get a, get their shots and their eczema flares up too because the immune system's revved up. They get a cold, they get strep throat um, or just being, you know, run down, worn out. All those things can bring it out. The immune system responds to all that. I mean, everything's kind of connected. Sure. Uh, and we already talked a bit about prednisone, but uh, here's a question about the risks. Can you clarify the risks of using prednisone? A short course was given to me seven days to address a severe flare-up. 
Yeah. So there are many, many risks of prednisone. Um, in the short term like that, there are relatively few, but uh, as you get longer and longer and more exposure to it, there's more. So everything from, you can get a condition called avascular necrosis of the bone. It can mess with the blood vessels in the bone. You can have like a little death of part of the bony tissue, which is really a real mess. It increases your blood pressure. It's not good for your eyes. Repeated exposure can cause glaucoma. It can increase your risk of cataract. Uh, it can affect your blood sugar. You know, there's a lot of stuff it's doing it puts you at risk for infection, of course, when you're on it, because it does suppress your immune system, all of these things. And many clinicians are so cavalier. They're like, ah, prednisone, come on, it's fine. We're used to it. We use it all the time, but it's very much like riding a motorcycle. Motorcycle folks, they usually don't, they're not circumspect. They jump on their motorcycle and boom, boom, but it's dangerous, right? It's really dangerous. When you, when you zoom out, it's like, wow, that, you know, they call them donor cycles, organ donor cycles, because those poor folks get, they get killed a lot, uh, much more than if you're driving in a car and certainly way more than if you're flying in a plane, right? Air, air travel is much safer, not perfect, nothing, nothing perfect, but it's fascinating to see the differences and how people treat it. Very cavalier with steroids, but yeah, a short course like that, the other big risk and this is often done by non-dermatologists because usually people who don't have to take care of the second half, you get seven days of steroid, boy, you feel great because that flare was so bad for seven days or eight days or 10 days. But then when it's out of your system, sometimes it's worse than ever before. And that's usually when I meet the patient because they're going, oh my goodness, it was terrible. I took the prednisone and I was so good. It was so great doc, but then it wore off and now I'm worse than ever before. What do I do now? Now we're in trouble. So that that's the other piece. It doesn't always happen. But when it does, it's a real nightmare. So I, I really try not to use it that way uh, whenever I can. Great. Okay, I want to thank everyone for all these really, really amazing questions. I'm so glad we got to get to so many of them. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us. And thank you, Dr. Leo, for helping us get a better understanding of eczema for all these newly diagnosed patients and caregivers. Uh, you can continue your eczema education on our website at nationaleczema.org. And you may register for an upcoming webinar or watch the recording of a previous webinar at nationaleczema.org slash webinar dash Wednesdays. On the behalf of the National Eczema Association, thank you to everyone for joining us. Mm -hmm.